Early explorers combed the corners of the world on death-defying expeditions. Sometimes they found land, sometimes living, breathing giants, and sometimes even monsters. Here are some of the craziest things discovered by explorers. Benedict and the Headhunters In 2017, explorer Benedict Allen set out into the jungles of Papua New Guinea. He went into the jungle alone, searching for a tribe of headhunters who he'd stumbled upon 30 years before. He went into the dense wilderness with no phone and no GPS. Then, nobody heard from him for three weeks. He was trying to film a documentary, but it didn't go according to plan. The tribe Benedict wanted to film is named the Yaifo. He was the one who discovered them decades ago, and nobody from the outside world had seen them since. The Yaifo are one of the very few remaining tribes that have no contact with the world at large. They are as remote as it gets, still waging war with rival groups deep in the uncharted jungle. Benedict wanted to see if anything had changed in the 30 years since he had first met them in the most remote part of Papua New Guinea. But when Benedict went to find them, he got stuck because there was an ongoing battle between a pair of tribes. He couldn't get to where he wanted to go, and then he got malaria. As if malaria wasn't bad enough already, he soon had dengue fever as well. He was only saved thanks to making it across the jungle to an airstrip where a pilot saw him from their plane. He never did document the Yaifo headhunters. Presumably, they are still hiding somewhere, their origins and traditions still a mystery. Maybe it's better that way for their own good. The Baffling Brazil Tablet The Americas were not discovered by Christopher Columbus. The New World was found by a group of African explorers 200 years before Columbus. Actually, the only real evidence of their discovery is a mysterious tablet found by an English explorer six centuries after the fact. Well, of course, you could argue that the Chinese and the Vikings arrived to the Americas even before that, but it could be possible that Africans were in America long before Columbus. I'll try to start at the beginning, in the year 1310, with a group of explorers from the African Kingdom of Mali. Records show a group of explorers led by King Abu Bakari set sail for new lands. There is no record of what happened to them, only that they departed with a great fleet and sailed across the Atlantic Ocean. This journey was later linked to an intriguing tablet uncovered in the Brazilian jungle by famous explorer Percy Fawcett. Percy found the tablet in a previously unexplored region of the jungle near the Kuluan River. This would have been on one of the colonel's earlier expeditions into the unknown at the beginning of the 20th century. The tablet itself is unmistakably African. It's a statue of what appears to be an African ruler with a distinct African crown. In the ruler's hands is a tablet inscribed with written characters. The writing has never been fully decrypted. Several other similar inscriptions have been found in Brazil's Bahia state. One was supposedly found engraved on an ancient tomb of someone named Pe. The bottom line is that Percy Fawcett, an early explorer himself, found evidence that Brazil was occupied by even earlier explorers from Africa. Many archaeological sites in the Amazon have been attributed to the African settlers 700 years ago. For example, the Cromlech of Calcoene in Brazil. It's a megalithic stone structure that looks similar to stone monuments found in West Africa. Some researchers believe the Africans built their homes on earthen mounds in Brazil and Venezuela. However, what happened to them is unknown. Nobody has ever found enough proof to convince mainstream archaeologists that Africans were the first ones to sail to the Americas. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. And now for a quick break, because I want to give a big shout out to Doggy Woggies. Love the name. Thanks so much for this super thanks. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. Amerigo Vespucci Have you ever wondered where America got its name from? If Christopher Columbus found the Americas before anybody else, why are both continents named after a different guy? Why isn't it Columbus Land? That's because the Americas are named after Amerigo Vespucci. Amerigo was born in 1454, the height of the Italian Renaissance. He came from a prominent family in Florence and had close ties to the Medici family. 
His father was in the government and his uncle was a Dominican friar. Early in his career, Amerigo worked as a banker, but soon he got bored and decided to become an adventurer. It's believed he had a meeting with Christopher Columbus in 1496, four years after Columbus's famous voyage in 1492. Amerigo helped prepare Columbus for his next great adventure. Don't forget that it's never too late to start doing what you want. Amerigo didn't become an explorer until he was in his 40s. He went on a journey to India, serving as the ship's astronomer and map maker. In 1499, he set sail from Spain. Although they were looking for India, they ended up arriving in South America, and they thought they were landing in Asia. The crew explored the coast of Brazil and Venezuela. It was an exciting time for Amerigo because he charted constellations. He was shocked to see how different they were from the constellations in Europe. He documented new types of flora and fauna. The crew encountered indigenous tribes, and Amerigo believed he was documenting the Ganges River, when in reality, it was the Amazon. Talk about getting his directions mixed up. Discussing his journey later, Amerigo said he saw such an infinite number of birds and trees, he thought he had entered paradise on Earth. In 1507, German cartographer Martin Walsemuller drew a map of the newly identified continent of South America. He named it Americus in honor of Americo Vespucci, and that's where the term America comes from. Visitors to North Sentinel Island on November 17, 2018, American missionary John Allen Chow tried to bring the word of God to the isolated tribe living on Sentinel Island. He paid about $300 to be smuggled onto the island by a group of five fishermen. As soon as he stepped foot on the shore, he was shot full of arrows and killed. John was not the first unfortunate explorer to regret stepping foot on Sentinel Island. Almost every encounter with the tribe over the past few centuries has ended in disaster. In 1981, a freighter by the name of Primrose ran aground on a coral reef near Sentinel Island. There were 28 crew members on board, stuck in the reef with no way out. They thought they were saved when the watchmen saw a group emerge from the thick jungle of the island. The crew figured it was a rescue party, but this rescue party was wielding bows, arrows, and spears, and they were all naked. The crew watched helplessly as the islanders started fashioning rudimentary wooden boats. The captain radioed headquarters in Hong Kong, saying it looked like the tribes people were going to board their ship. The crew was soon saved by an Indian Navy boat, but it had been a stressful situation. The tribe had been firing at them with their arrows from the shore. A decade earlier, in 1974, a National Geographic crew tried to film a documentary on the island. One of them was shot by an arrow, and they all had to leave. In 2006, a pair of men were looking for flotsam when they accidentally ran aground. The people on North Sentinel Island chopped them into pieces and then displayed their bodies from bamboo poles like scarecrows. So why are the people on North Sentinel Island so afraid of strangers? It has to be for a reason. In 1857, North Sentinel Island and the surrounding islands of the Andaman Archipelago became a permanent British colony. There were about 5,000 tribespeople across the Andamans in that year. But by 1931, there were only 460. British explorers and slave traders killed almost all the locals. And this is why the Sentinelese are so violent toward outsiders. The tribe has been living on the island for an estimated 30,000 years. The current policy by the Indian government is to please leave them alone. The Giants of Patagonia Ferdinand Magellan was a very brave explorer. In 1520, he journeyed beyond where those who had gone before him were ambushed and eaten alive in South America. He reached the epic landscape of Patagonia, where he encountered a tribe of giants. Magellan looked over the edge of his ship and saw an enormous giant estimated at 10 feet tall. The giant was dancing and singing naked. It was the strangest encounter in the history of exploration. On this journey was scholar Antonio Pigafetta. He kept a diary of everything that happened on Magellan's voyage. According to Antonio's documents, Magellan sent one of the men from his ship to make contact with the giant. The man sang and danced to demonstrate friendship, then lured the giant to a small offshore island. Magellan went to greet the giant, who apparently thought the explorers had come from the sky. He was so tall that none of the crew members passed his waist. He also had a great booming voice. 
Could this be proof that South America was once ruled by a race of giants? Or did Ferdinand's whole crew greatly exaggerate the strange people they met? Historians believe Magellan did indeed meet a tribe from the Tehuelche culture. The Tehuelche were very large people, but they were hardly giants. It was more that the Europeans were super short by modern standards. Most of Magellan's crew probably stood a little over five feet, making them tiny by modern standards. On the other side, the Tehuelche were large, robust people. More than likely, they weren't more than six feet, but still would have been shocking to the Europeans. In the end, Magellan kidnapped two tribe members and tried to bring them back to Spain. But they died in the voyage and had to be thrown overboard. When Sir Francis Drake made his voyage to Patagonia years later, he witnessed the same people. In 1628, his nephew wrote that the giants were not as monstrous as Magellan had made them out to be. They were just really, really tall. The Fountain of Youth in the 4th century BC, Alexander the Great supposedly came across a river of paradise. The Macedonian ruler believed he had discovered the Fountain of Youth. Similar legends appear all throughout history, from Japan to England. In the age of exploration, there was one guy who was desperate to find the legendary fountain for himself. His name was Ponce de Leon. He accompanied Christopher Columbus on his second voyage to the New World in the year 1493. A decade later, in 1504, Ponce de Leon was stationed on the island of Hispaniola. He crushed a rebellion by the local Taino people and for his brutality was granted provincial governorship. Ponce de Leon used slave labor to grow crops and tend livestock. In 1508, he was allowed to colonize San Juan Bautista, the place we now call Puerto Rico. He was the very first governor of the island. Then in 1512, he went exploring again he settled an island called Bimini. The next year, in 1513, he set sail with a trio of ships and anchored off the east coast of Florida. He went ashore and embarked upon a journey through the Florida Keys. The explorer had a few skirmishes with the locals, did a U-turn, and headed back to Puerto Rico. Along the way, he allegedly discovered the Gulf Stream. That would make him responsible for finding the fastest route to sail back to Europe by utilizing the wind of the Gulf Stream. You might be wondering about the Fountain of Youth, but don't worry, I'll get there. First, let's look at Ponce de Leon's brutal downfall. Eight years after his first trip to Florida, he returned and tried to establish a colony. One of the natives shot him with an arrow and he died. This was before anyone had figured out if Florida was an island or a peninsula. To this day, nobody has ever found any archaeological remains of Ponce de Leon's final voyage. Now for the fountain. There are no historical records tied to Ponce de Leon that even mention the Fountain of Youth. His name only became synonymous with the legendary fountain after his death. In the year 1535, Ponce de Leon was accused of seeking the fountain because he was impotent. Early Spanish historians started calling him an idiot and a weakling. Soon, legends spread across Europe and the New World that Ponce was desperately chasing tales of a magical fountain that could grant him immortality. It's said to be somewhere in Florida or in the Caribbean on one of the islands, but nobody's ever found it. Or at least if they have, they're not sharing. Where do you think the Fountain of Youth would be? The Living Stone there is a famous monument in the African nation of Burundi called the Living Stone. It marks the spot where two of the earliest European explorers in Africa met in the 19th century. I'm talking about Dr. David Livingstone and Henry Morton Stanley. Both men were responsible for some of the most incredible early discoveries on the African continent. Livingstone was a Scottish missionary born in 1813, which was in the golden age of European exploration. He made excursions deep into Central Africa, discovering geographical features like Lake Malawi and Victoria Falls. He fought against the African slave trade and brought Christianity to Central Africa, whether the locals wanted him to or not. Although he is credited for his introduction of Christianity, he didn't convert that many people. Records show he only converted a single tribal leader named Sekele. However, Sekele soon found himself at odds with the rule of monogamy and renounced Christianity. In 1865, Livingstone vanished without a trace. For six years, the outside world heard nothing from him. Another explorer decided he needed to go on a rescue mission. 
Sir Henry Morton Stanley from Wales went hunting for Livingstone. He finally found him in 1871 in the now extinct kingdom of Burundi. Livingstone had never been missing. He had known where he was the entire time. He'd even been sending letters home, it's just that they never got there. It turned out he had been robbed of his possessions and got incredibly sick. When Henry found him, Livingstone was residing with the natives near Lake Tanganyika. When the two men met, Henry uttered the famous words, Dr. Livingstone, I presume? Livingstone refused to return to Europe, though. He was desperate to find the source of the Nile. He continued his adventures through Africa and died two years later in 1873. The Livingstone Monument is a great stone marker commemorating his many deeds in Africa. Thanks for watching. If you could go back in time, which famous explorer ship would you like to be on? Thanks for watching. Be sure to stay tuned for extra content you might have missed. Abandoned Insane Asylums The U.S. is scattered with abandoned mental institutions, which largely emptied out during a period called deinstitutionalization. After the first antipsychotic medication was developed in 1955, many patients received a prescription and were sent home. As a result, insane asylums began shuttering their doors en masse and were left frozen in time. In 2016, Canadian photographer Matt Vandervelde captured shocking images as part of a project to document these deserted establishments. The photos reveal the hidden aspects of institutionalized life that were never accessible to the general public. For example, on a positive note, a picture of an old bowling alley shows that some facilities afforded patients at least a bare minimum level of recreation. Other images, including one of a morgue and another of an overgrown cemetery, serve as reminders of the thousands of people who died at these places. Bathtubs were used for something called hydrotherapy, which involved exposing patients to warm water to calm them down. This was one of the more humane treatments that mental asylums used on their patients, as it seemed to actually be effective. However, ice baths and electrocution were also common, and many treatments today would be considered torture. Whatever went on behind these closed doors was usually creepy. Hanging Bones in 1999, a farmer named Tony Martin was convicted of murder for shooting and killing a teenage burglar who entered his Norfolk, England home. Martin had reportedly lived in isolation for decades and had a reputation for being a recluse. His charges were eventually reduced to manslaughter, and he was released from prison in 2003. To evade unwanted publicity, the senior citizen moved to an undisclosed address instead of returning to his farmhouse. A YouTuber going by the name Abandoned World Explorer UK was curious about the residence, but was apparently unaware of the crime that had been committed there. The urban explorer spotted the house while on vacation in 2018 and decided to go inside while filming the experience. They found the interior covered in overgrowth, with animal bones on the floor and strung from the ceiling, as if they were assembled into some sort of spooky decoration. There was also a classic MK1 Range Rover in the garage, and the property was strewn with rusting farm equipment. In the video, the narrator describes the house as resembling something from the Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie and said that they were too intimidated to ever return to the scene. Nobody knows how or why the bones ended up inside Martin's home, or who put them there. Burj Al Babas Roughly halfway between Istanbul, Turkey's largest city, and Ankara, its capital, there is an abandoned hillside development consisting of hundreds of miniature castle-like chalets in various states of completion. Construction began in 2014 under the Serot Group, with plans for 732 chateaux to be built. Over the next few years, 350 of the homes were sold. But buyers and investors began to pull out amid an economic downturn in Turkey caused by rising oil prices, a failed coup, and inflation. Facing mounting debts in excess of $27 million, the Serot Group went into bankruptcy in 2018, and the partially finished development was abandoned. The following year, a court granted permission for construction to resume, but the COVID-19 pandemic ground things to a halt just months later. For now, the manufactured Disney castle-like town's future remains uncertain. In the meantime, the site has become a magnet for urban explorers. Footage from TikTok user Big Banks and others has appeared in recent months, showing the eerily silent collection of chalets which, by now, were supposed to be filled with families calling them home. A Chilling Message 
Social media users went into a panic earlier this year when images surfaced, showing the inside of an abandoned hut in Lincolnshire, England. The viral photos were posted by urban explorer Dan Sharkey, who said he found the conspicuous concrete structure near the back of a property. Sharkey descended a ladder into the bunker and discovered an array of bizarre graffiti. Scrawled across the walls were an angry-looking stick figure, a man bleeding from his mouth, and a strange landscape of red and black trees. Above two rustling bed frames and an old blanket, in all capital letters, were the words, Crawl inside it will give you a hug, along with a black arrow pointing toward a hole in the bunker. The hole was too small for even a child to fit inside, but the scene was nevertheless creepy. Sharky's discovery sparked widespread interest from social media users around the world. Many commenters focused on the structure's disturbing contents, while others were more concerned with when and why the bunker was built. Some speculated that the bunker was once used by the Royal Observer Corps, a civil defense organization that existed from 1925 until the late 90s. One of the most sobering comments came from someone who remarked that it's a shame that people vandalize and destroy abandoned spaces that could be maintained and used as attractions or repurposed for some other use. When you think about it from this angle, the site becomes less creepy and more sad than anything else. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. Discovery Island In Bay Lake, Florida, there is a small 11.5 acre island that was once home to Disney's Discovery Island Park. From 1974 to 1999, visitors traveled there to see rare birds and other exotic wild animals. Discovery Island shuttered its doors for unknown reasons after operating for 25 years and relocated the animals to Animal Kingdom. It's believed that poor attendance and high maintenance costs contributed to the park's closure. Since then, the site has sat abandoned, drawing curious urban explorers like blogger Shane Perez and his friends, who swam through alligator-infested waters to reach the island in 2009. They immediately noticed that they were surrounded by what seemed like thousands of birds. The group discovered that the lights still worked and encountered several angry vultures during their visit. They also observed the haunting remnants of the park that were left behind and had become overgrown with wildlife. Scattered throughout the deserted buildings were old photos of employees, preserved snakes in jars, and plenty of garbage, including old Coke bottles. Not all of the unwelcome visitors who have made their way to Discovery Island found it as unsettling as Perez and his pals did. Last year, authorities discovered a man camping on the island. He described the site as a tropical paradise and said that he didn't know he wasn't allowed to be there. He was nevertheless ordered to leave. Would you explore an abandoned theme park if you could, or have you already? Let me know in the comments below. Plus, Glenlifon Mansion TikTok has become a popular platform for urban explorers to share their discoveries. A user by the name of Escapades, with a Z, recently posted footage of an abandoned 19th century mansion in the Welsh countryside known as Plas Glynlifon. I'm sure I'm not saying that right. Built in 1830 by a politician named Lord Newborough, the sprawling estate is filled with old chandeliers, vintage maps and pictures on the walls, spiraling staircases, wooden horse and eagle statues, and furniture from a long-ago era, including beds with the linens still on them. The video's narrator explains that someone bought the mansion but couldn't afford the upkeep, so they deserted it. According to the BBC, a couple named Paul and Rowena Williams had purchased it in 2016, with plans to turn it into a luxury hotel. But the project proved to be too expensive and they defaulted on the loan. Property developer David Savage bought the ailing structure earlier this year. He told local news sources that he's exploring all possible options for restoring it into a functional property. But for now, the derelict mansion continues to rot away, attracting explorers like escapades, who pointed out how sad it is that such a beautiful property has sat neglected for so long. Cremated Human Remains In 2017, Michigan's Department of Licensing and Regulatory Affairs discovered numerous disturbing violations at the Swanson Funeral Home in Flint. Inspectors found decomposing bodies, dirty preparation rooms, maggots, and blood-stained casket pillows. The agency was quick to suspend Swanson's license, and instead of making any improvements, the business's owner, O'Neill Swanson II, appears to have simply left the property as is. An anonymous urban explorer was brave enough to enter the abandoned building in 2020 
and found bottles of chemicals, soiled embalming instruments, and a plastic bag filled with what looked like cremated human remains. The media obtained and published images of the explorer's gruesome discoveries, adding to the growing list of complaints against the shuttered business. In addition to keeping filthy conditions at the funeral home, Swanson was accused of selling prepaid funeral contracts without a license. He pled no contest to two felony counts of failing to escrow the prepaid funds and using some of the money for personal expenses. A judge ordered him to pay $75,000 in restitution to his victims. But the disgraced former funeral home director continued to operate despite having lost his license. Earlier this year, state investigators caught Swanson somehow operating another business without the proper credentials. The conditions inside Tri-County Cremation Services were similar to those found at the Swanson Funeral Home just a few years earlier. Inspectors counted 55 human corpses, including the body of someone who died nearly three years earlier. Most of the remains were not embalmed, and the thermostat was set to 77 degrees. Swanson is currently entangled in an ongoing felony criminal case as the allegations against him continue to mount, and the recently discovered crematory has been condemned. Whether or not it will receive any visits from urban explorers remains to be seen. A deserted mansion England sure seems to have its fair share of abandoned mansions. While driving on the outskirts of North London one day last year, urban explorer Colin Smith spotted a spooky mansion set back behind a long, overgrown driveway. Curious to see what was inside, he went back a few days later to look around. Smith later told reporters that the property was, in his words, quite creepy because it was so dark and the house was so big. He learned that the eight-bedroom house dates back to the 1930s. It has servant quarters and a bell system for summoning staff. Inside, Smith found a grand piano, furniture, old bottles of wine, a pair of glasses, painted portraits, silver cutlery, books, black and white photographs, and newspapers from as far back as 1954. YouTube footage also shows dining ware, cleaning supplies, and a clock on the wall that stopped a few minutes past 6.30. Based on the sell-by dates on old cans of food that were left behind, Smith determined that the house had been abandoned around 30 years earlier. He also found a fridge full of moldy food. It's a mystery why the property owners abandoned the lavish home without taking their belongings. Their seemingly rushed departure left an eerie time capsule filled with the scattered remnants of their time spent there. When the media asked for his thoughts, Smith speculated that the house was sold to a property tycoon who lacked the time or resources to renovate it. Jimmy Saville's Abandoned Lair Jimmy Saville was a UK-based TV presenter who found himself in hot water numerous times over allegations of pedophilia. But for one reason or another, prosecutors never seemed to think there was a strong enough case to pursue in court. Following Seville's death in 2011, the BBC launched an investigation into the decades-long series of scandals. Hundreds of people came forward, and the evidence was overwhelming, but it was too late to bring him to justice. A group of urban explorers who document their adventures on TikTok recently went inside Alt Nare, Seville's abandoned cottage in the Scottish Highlands. It's in this so-called house of horrors that he allegedly abused many of his victims. Just knowing what may have gone on there is disturbing enough, but a previous visitor made sure to remind people by scrawling the word pedo across the side of the building with black spray paint. The interior is filled with scattered pieces of wood, broken glass, garbage, and crumbling plaster. There are holes in the walls and the windows are boarded up. Oddly, the property does have an owner. An unidentified elderly couple bought it years ago. In fact, they paid double the asking price for it, but they never did anything with the cottage, and it's slowly given way to the effects of time and the elements. A body. Last year, urban explorer and photographer Paul Jones decided to take a peek around the abandoned home of former wrestling star Jackie Paolo. As he explored the house in Manston, England, Jones snapped photos of a grand piano and other items that lay among the crumbling ruins. As he later explained to the press, he suddenly spotted something that seemed off. In Paolo's words, I saw a door which was shut with some rope across it, and when I tried to push it open, I could see there was a mattress up against it on the other side. He explained that he just knew there was a body in the room. As soon as Paolo managed to push the door open, his fear was confirmed. The shocked explorer speculated that the individual was homeless and had pushed the mattress against the door to keep people out of the room. Based on how recently one of his friends had been at the property, 
Paolo guessed that the body had been there for several weeks. The discovery is both disturbing and heartbreaking, as he pointed out, stating that the man was someone's son who may have a family somewhere, and that it was upsetting for a human being to die the way he did. Police found no evidence of foul play and concluded that the death was tragic, but not suspicious. Thanks for watching! Have you ever been urban exploring and found anything super creepy? Let me know in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already! See you next time! Bye!